June 2nd Board of Education meeting to order. Roll call, please, Rwanda. Robert Lee Present. Mary Gill. 
Here, Sean Hamilton. Here, Quentin Harmon. Here, Chuck Lander. Here, Steve Rogers. Here, will you stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Online, uh, Mr. Castle, would you like to address the board? I would, thank you. Please. Good evening, members of the Board of Education. Thank you for the time to speak with you today regarding the proposed elimination of the K-5 Spanish program in our district. My name is Tyler Castle. I am a Spanish teacher at Cole State High School and the World Language Department Chair for the district. In 2008, I was hired along with Ronnie Aldridge and three others to create and implement a K-12 Spanish program. With the support of the school board and Dr. Bug, we have been very successful in our mission to offer a K-12 program here at Cole City. Mm -hmm. Our program has grown tremendously since the implementation of the elementary school program in our district. In 2010, we had only 11 students complete the highest level of Spanish at Cole City High School. This year, we had 51 students complete either Spanish or AP Spanish. We've had tremendous success with our AP Spanish language and culture course with about an 88% passing rate, and many of our students earn a four or higher. We have increased the number of sections of Spanish at the high school from 12 when we started the K-12 program in 2008 to 18 sections in 2016, a number which we have maintained through the current academic year. We have also founded the Cole City Chapter of the Spanish National Honor Society at high school, thanks in part to Mrs. Sangras' leadership and time. Every year, many of our college-bound students go on to study Spanish, and, earn, and earning a major or a minor in Spanish has become more commonplace for our Cole City High School graduates. Our students have been at an advantage because of the experience at our, with our K-12 Spanish program. The establishment of our elementary Spanish program in 2008 by Mrs. Aldridge has been instrumental in contributing to the growth of the entire Spanish program at Cole City Unit School District Number 1. Our students have been exposed to another language and culture at a young age, in which the brain development is best for language acquisition. The elimination of this program would be a mistake. Our young students who have been exposed to another language and culture in our district because of our elementary Spanish pr program could now get nothing. In this increasingly diverse world, knowledge of another language and culture has become an essential part of an education. Language learning helps to bridge cultural divides and unite people, something that is vital in 2021. It is important that we instill these values at a young age. In 2008, our district had the foresight to see the importance of learning another language at this elementary level. And now, perhaps the need for cultural, intercultural intelligence and understanding is even greater. We would be moving backwards as a district by eliminating this important program. Thank you for your time. Okay. <coughs> Questions, anybody? No. no. Thanks, Dad. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Castle. We will certainly take that into consideration. Uh, we appreciate your comments. Thank you. Okay, any communication from floor in regard to agenda items or anything in general at this time? Welcome, Steve. Thank you. All right, are there items that the board would like to remove from the consent agenda? Hearing none, then I will entertain a first and second motion to approve the consent agenda, including the minutes and closed session minutes from the regular meeting of May 5th, the activity, the April activity fund reports, the April treasurer's report, the May monthly check, manual check reports, the May payrolls, the June accounts payable, personnel items, including approval of resignations, employee transfers, employment, authorization, leaves, requests, extracurricular assignments, and to approve the following building usages as listed. Chuck so moves and Quint seconds. Roll call, please. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I just want to bring to the board's attention that uh, on the consent agenda is employment authorization, giving me the authorization to hire staff members between over the summertime so that we can uh, make sure that we don't have to wait for board meetings. It's very, very competitive out there right now. Um, we have some special ed openings, and I think, Tammy, how many were posted? 
last time you checked? 300 since January. Three, 300 openings in the state. And we've got some openings that we have no applicants for right now. So it's becoming very, very competitive. And so when we get someone, I would like to have the authority to be able to hire them on the spot when the principals instead of making them wait a month. So I just want to make sure the board knew that was on there and make sure you understood you were giving me that authority until the end of the month, until the end of August. Absolutely. Anybody have any problems? No. No, no sir. Okay. Roll call, please, Wanda. Chuck Landon. Yes. Ben Harmon. Yes. Robert Dean Hood. Yes. Mary Dean. Yes. Sean Hamilton. Yes. Steve Rogers. Yes. Tim Bell. Yes. Any questions about the administrative reports? Okay, then. This is race. The last time you and Luke have anything you want to mention. I have nothing. Thank you to Sandy for everything. Thank you to the board. Um, it's been really, really helpful and appreciative for me to have an opportunity to you know, basically work with her for a full year. So I do appreciate that. I know we have some big shoes to fill, uh, but I think she's done a great job of preparing me and I wish her the best. Um, she promised she'll keep her cell phone on so I can call her in the So <laughs> again, just really appreciate everything she's done. Sandy, as we said this morning, we certainly appreciate your contribution to the district. It's been wonderful. And we're going to miss you. That's for sure. For sure, for sure. Well, I'd like to thank the board for everything they've done and allowed me to do on the time to do this. It's been a rough day. Yes, I'm sure it is. I can't thank you enough for the support that you had for me and my vision and making things happen in the district as a whole. The teachers, everybody's done a really nice job in accepting these kids back into the district and being allowed to, as the reason we did it all was to have local ownership of our own kids and not have somebody else in control of our kids. And I, I, it's been a fabulous journey. I've had a great time. It's been fun. I'm going to miss it unbelievably a lot. Um, but I, Luke's going to do a wonderful job. And everybody just has been amazing. So, <laughs> yeah, later. Good luck, good luck in your retirement, Sandy. And I will tell you, the first few times you drive by the building, you'll wonder. But then after a while, it kind of, you know, it kind of goes away. <laughs> All right, but thank you, thank you, for being. We're looking forward to some good things with Luke too. Absolutely. Okay, Tammy, anything you got? I can't follow that. No, I don't know. I'll entertain questions. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for Tammy? Okay, Dr. Bob. Um, a few items for you in my report. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to thank uh, Board President Miller and Quint Harmon for coming to this morning's breakfast. I can't tell you how refreshing it was to be able to. Uh, have our entire staff together for the first time since August of 2019. Um, yeah, I think it was good for everyone's soul just to uh, be able to be together again. So uh, that was very nice. And we were also able to uh, recognize the retirees from our district as we always do. I think that's one of the nicest traditions that we have. Um, so that went very, very well. So uh, I appreciated them coming and representing the board. Um, before I get to a couple other things on my report, I do want to mention something that's not in my report. Um, every year, the Illinois Press Association solicits entries from local newspapers to participate in a statewide journalism competition. Entries are judged in three dozen subject categories. One of those categories is best school board coverage, and that's sponsored by the Illinois Association of School Boards. The Robert M. Cole Award for Best School Board Coverage was named for the first full-time executive director of the Illinois Association of School Boards and recognizes outstanding coverage of education issues that emphasize the community's connection with its local public school district. Judges evaluate entries for contribution to public understanding of local school governance and support for effective dialogue that helps the community and school board define major public policy issues. Judging criteria also includes enterprise, depth of reporting, and clarity of writing. Uh, I'm very happy and proud to announce that in the non-daily division, the Cole Award for 2021 was presented to our own Ann Gill of the Cole City Corrupt for coverage of Unit 1 School District. 
They said that her work contributed to community understanding of governance work and issues facing the district, especially the Dresden closing with knowledge, clarity, and depth. Her pieces were well explained, written, and presented and an asset to the community dialogue. So I wanna take a moment to uh, congratulate Ann Gill for her award. Congratulations. <laughs> As I've said multiple times, um, it wouldn't, those awards wouldn't happen without an open board and the community. Well, we, we appreciate what you do, and uh, you are always thorough and fair, and we appreciate that very much. And happy belated birthday. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ann. Happy birthday. So, um, another thing that I want to just say very quickly, and I mentioned it this morning. Uh, I, I do want to give a public thanks to all of our faculty and staff um, for what they were able to accomplish this year. Uh, this was I, this is my 32nd year in public education, and this was far and away the most challenging year I've ever experienced. No amount of experience, education, or training can prepare you for what we had to deal with this year. And you know, when, when so many other school districts, I feel like kind of threw up their hands and said, we can't do this. Our staff and teachers said, no, we, we need our kids here. We've got to find a way to get our kids here. And uh, I, I appreciate what they did. And it wasn't just our teachers, it's our cafeteria staff, it's our custodians, it's our clericals, it's our aides, it's our substitute teachers. Um, it, it was everybody that made that happen. And I also want to give a public thanks to our parents. Um, you know, I, I can't say enough about how supportive our parents were this year. I said at the beginning of the year, if we were going to get through this, it was about everybody showing patience, flexibility, and understanding. And our, our parents were absolutely unbelievable this year with the number of times that they were inconvenienced with kids that had to be home on quarantine because of close contact and, you know, kids that had to wear face masks at school and uh, they, they were just tremendous. So, you know, they, they talk about how it takes a village. Uh, it, it really does. It did take a village for us to get through this this year. So um, very, very thankful. And I, I just wanted to publicly state that. I also, and I said it this morning, I want to publicly thank our Board of Education. Um, I'm sure all of you have read stories from across the country where boards made this a political issue and may actually made the jobs of educators more difficult instead of easier. And this Board of Education trusted our educational professionals to do their job. And when we came to you with the return to school plan, you said go. And when we came to you that we were ready to go full day, you said go. And I appreciate the fact that you trusted us and you never made our jobs more difficult in what was already an extremely difficult year. So thanks to the Board of Education, I, I appreciate that support very, very much. So well, thank you. Thank you to you, because without your leadership, we wouldn't be there either. You know, this is one of those things where we just said, go and we'll get out of your way because we don't want to be in the way. And I think this gentleman and, and along with his staff did a tremendous job. I, I can't imagine being in any other situation where it was as, it was relatively as easy as he made it. So thanks to you, Dr. Bugg. It was a team effort. Without gotta, you, we wouldn't have done it. I got a great team and uh, I would put my team up against anybody. So Absolutely. I, I appreciate that. A um, couple other things I want to mention. I want to thank the community once again uh, at our scholarship night. Uh, we awarded $85,029 in scholarships to our kids. Uh, those of you that have kids going to college or been to college, you know what the cost of that is nowadays. Um, right, Chuck? Oh, yeah. And uh, Amen. so the community stepping up and helping our kids, uh, you know, that can make the difference in whether a kid goes to school or doesn't go to school. And uh, almost all of those are community based scholarships. So uh, I want to thank our community for that support because they're making a difference in kids lives. And I appreciate that. Uh, another topic that I want to spend a couple minutes on. Um, recently, U.S. News and World Report came out with their rankings of the best public high schools in Illinois, and there's all sorts of these rankings that come out all the time. Um, and I, I normally, you know, I read them, put a little stock in, in it, try to see is there something we can learn from it as, as 
we look uh, at these rankings. U.S. News and World Reports put out rankings for years. Um, and Mr. Spencer and I met and talked about it uh, because, you know, when we first got notification of it, we're looking and, you know, we see we're ranked number 202. And I'm like, well, I'm not sure we want to celebrate being 202. You know, let's, let's see what we can learn. But then you start looking deeper into it. And as I started analyzing where we're at in comparison with other schools in our conference and our neighbors and how they rate schools and what the methodology is, um, when you start looking a little closer uh, of the Interstate 8, or it's not the Interstate 8 anymore, sorry, the Central Illinois Central 8, uh, we, we are the second highest ranked school in the conference behind Lyle. And as you know, Lyle has a different, very different area, you know, different region. Um, and really, it's really not even that close that we're the second ranked school uh, compared to the others. And then you start looking a little further about how they rank those schools. And, you know, they look at math achievement, reading achievement, graduation rate. But what they put a lot of stock in is college readiness. And when you start looking at how they rank college readiness, I think there's some lessons there for us. And one of the things, in fact, the thing that they look at for college readiness is what percentage of your kids are in an AP class and what percentage of your kids pass an AP class. So that got me interested in trying to do a little research because we've made a lot of progress in our AP offerings over the years. Um, when I first started here, and I'm not taking credit because it's, it's all this lady right here, Tammy Elledge, but uh, we had zero AP courses here. We had dual credit courses, uh, but we had no AP courses. And now when, and Chris Spencer had helped me put this together, when you look at our conference schools, Lyle High School has 14 AP courses. We have 13 AP courses. Um, the next closest in our conference has eight. And so we, we offer a tremendous number of AP courses for our kids. In fact, uh, we were ready to offer 14 AP courses, but we didn't get enrollment in one of the courses that we were wanting to offer. So I, I'm very, very proud of that because according to these rankings and according to the, the new format that's coming out on how we determine whether our kids are college ready or not at the state level. It's all about kids being in an AP course. And what we're learning is if our high school kids that are going to college are not in an AP course, they are not college ready. Our kids need that experience. And, and we have to do a better job in our district of getting that word out to our parents because AP courses are hard, they're challenging. And unfortunately, sometimes that effort doesn't wanna be put in to take an AP course. But kids that are going to college, if they don't have that AP experience, according to the state of Illinois, they're not gonna be college ready. And according to something like these rankings, they're not college ready either. So we need to continue expanding that. And one of the things I think is fantastic about our school district is I can guarantee you Lyle is not sending 50% of their juniors and seniors to GABC. So we're getting these rankings while we're also sending kids to career training, which is fantastic as well. So, um, you know, and when you look at dual credit, we still offer five dual credit courses. So dual credit is out there, but we have really tried to get our focus on our AP offerings. <clears throat> And I think what we're seeing from national rankings and from state rankings is that that is, that is really the key, um, that, that experience, because it gives kids a curricular rigor that they don't get in other courses. Um, and AP courses are recognized across the country. Dual credit is not recognized across the country. So when our kids get an AP credit, they can take that anywhere with them. And we have a lot of kids that are going to college out of state right now. So there's some lessons there. Chris and I have talked about that. And, and it's something that we're really going to push moving forward. But I'm very, very proud um, of our high school and the efforts that we've made. As you know, a few years ago, we were on the AP District Honor Roll behind you uh, because of the courses that we've offered. So I'm very proud in our district that uh, we have a great program to get our kids ready for college. And we have a great program to get our kids ready for uh, careers as well. Um, 
So just some things that I wanted to mention, as you may see some of this stuff come out in the press regarding these rankings uh, and where we're at. But I'll entertain any questions that anybody might have on any of that. Do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Bogdanovich. That was, that was good. I totally agree with you. Okay, let's move on then. Chuck, anything from GNEC? Nope. Any questions about that report? Just want to mention one thing. Um, many of you were aware that our building trades instructor, Bob Humbert, had a, yeah. a very, very serious medical issue. Uh, miraculously, he's back at work. Um, absolutely incredible. So yeah. we're very, very thankful. Uh, that he's back, and uh, it's really miraculous that he's back, considering the issue that he had. So, very, very pleased with that, and I, I just wanted to mention that. I was sad to see our egg instructor have to resign. Yeah, I was too. Was she's too she's, she's really done a tremendous job, but we did hire a new ag yeah. instructor, yeah. and the ag instructor is ready to go. It's a unique background. The uh, previous ag instructor we had was from the beautiful town of Tuscola, Illinois. <laughs> oh, um, Southern Holy cow. And, <laughs> and uh, the air's a little cleaner down there. <laughs> and um, so uh, she brought uh, that background. The person that we have now comes actually from the Chicago School of Agriculture and brings a very, very different oh, yeah. background to us, which I think is going to be fantastic. And she was blown away when she came and saw the farm um, and, and the things that she could do there. Well, they, so, used, they used to do, uh, their, their ag was inside of a warehouse. warehouse. <laughs> right. yeah. So, yeah. 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 But uh, she went to a, a junior college, I can't remember which one, um, over by the Quad Cities. She went to junior college because she wanted the, the true, you know, rural ag experience and she got that there. And so we're, we're very excited about oh, yeah. it. We, uh, Chuck was at the meeting, we proved her at the last Good, good. Yeah. Okay, any questions about the athletic report? Again, any communication from the floor in regard to agenda items or anything in general? And hearing none, we'll move on to old business then. <clears throat> we'll entertain a first and second motion to approve the foreign language transition plan as presented. Um, Sean so moves. Do I have a second? A few seconds. Anyone yeah, let me just mention a few things. And there's an enclosure in there. The board has seen this uh, in the past. Um, and, and I do very much appreciate uh, Senior Castle's uh, comments because he is very, very passionate about his program. And, and I appreciate that. And any of you who have ever had a kid experience his classes or seen him teach, he is a master teacher. Unbelievable. Um, so I, I greatly appreciate his comments. Uh, that being said, I do want to give just a quick explanation and reminder to the board of what our foreign language transition plan is going to look like because the goal of our plan is not to reduce opportunity. The goal of our plan is to increase opportunity, especially for our high school students. So as you know, anytime we have a staff member leave or transfer, the board's directive is to always look for opportunities for continuous improvement. And uh, as you know, our district is not in a financial position right now to be adding staff. So if we are going to, to increase opportunities, we have to find a way to restructure. Um, so we had that opportunity. And uh, as Tyler said, and I'm very, very proud of that. I was the driving force behind implementing K-8 Spanish years ago, but I'm also going to be the first to admit that there have been uh, challenges with implementation. And one of those challenges has been because of scheduling, it's 30 minutes twice a week, which makes it very, very difficult when you're only getting 30 minutes twice a week. Secondly, when kids are receiving uh, interventions for reading and math, they get pulled out often of Spanish classes. And in talking to Sandy today, um, we probably have about 20% of our kids that were only getting Spanish once a week if at all, because they're, they were being pulled out for their reading and math interventions. Um, another problem, you know, is that if we were going to increase to more than 30 minutes twice a week, we would have had to add staff. And Mr. Spencer can tell you finding Spanish teachers is more difficult than finding special ed teachers right now. Um, it, it's very, very challenging. And <clears throat> 
we also would have had to add staff, which we are not in a position as a district right now to be in the position of adding staff to do that. So due to some of these concerns, we had previously eliminated Spanish from K through two, but we kept it at three through five. With our middle school Spanish teacher transferring to another position, we had an opportunity to look at possibly restructuring. And I wanna make it clear, this is not a cost saving measure, but it does allow us to increase language opportunities for our high school students at no added cost to the board. So there are two major goals to this transition. One goal is to add a second language at the high school, which our school district has not had in 20 years. When we had 400 students, we had two languages. Now that we have 650, we have one. Um, a school our size needs to be offering two language opportunities to our students. And uh, this allows us to do that. And we're doing it very uniquely by uh, recommending the addition of American Sign Language, which is recognized as a foreign language. Um, Tammy has checked numerous places. The colleges that require a foreign language requirement accept American foreign language as that foreign language requirement. So it gives our kids another option that may not be interested in a traditional foreign language study to still get exposed to a different language. Um, it's becoming very, very popular in the suburban schools, and we're excited that we may be able to lead the way in our area in offering that to our students. Uh, another goal of our plan is to allow our students to pursue Spanish one credit in eighth grade. Um, I would highly recommend that the board maintain its commitment to our 6-8 uh, Spanish program. Um, our 6-8 program is fairly unique as well in that most schools don't offer a middle school Spanish program. By offering our kids the opportunity to get Spanish one credit in eighth grade, they have the ability then to pursue two languages at the high school level. And so it will open more opportunities for them as well. Um, so once implemented, we believe this plan is gonna increase academic opportunities for our students, help us with some scheduling issues and implementation issues that we've had at the elementary level. And we're gonna be able to do all this at no additional cost to the board at a time when our financial situation is still very uncertain. So with that, I will answer any questions. Mr. Miller. Anybody, any questions? Okay, roll call please, Wanda. Sean Hamilton? Yes. Steve Rogers? Yes. Robert Bianco? Yes. Mary Gill? Yes. Cliff Harmon? Yes. Jeff Lander? Yes. Tim Bell? Yes. Entertain a first and second motion to approve the FAIRCOM special assessment of $5,000 for the Energy Legislation Initiative. Chuck so moves and Bob seconds. Dr. Bob? Yeah, so um, I want to give you a, a background of where we're at, and I've tried to keep the board updated, and this is a very important community issue as well. As you know, the Dresden station was announced for premature closure in November of 2021, uh, that they are scheduled to close. We learned this in August of, late August of 2020. Um, since that time, we've been working very, very hard to try to advocate, as I told the board, number one, to keep the plan open, and number two, to make sure we have a financial plan should that plant close, because as the board knows, our school district receives $16 million a year directly in property tax revenue from the Dresden Nuclear Power Station. It also funds uh, a similar percentage of the fire district, the library district. Um, it is essential to our community, not only from property tax dollars, but from uh, uh, value of homes, property tax rates, and jobs that are created by that plant and by the surrounding plants. So we've been working very, very hard. As you know, our school district has been a longtime member of FAIRCOM, um, the Fair Assessment Information Resource Committee. I'm the president, been the president for 16 years. We represent 32 taxing districts across the state that all have either nuclear plants, solar or wind facilities within their uh, taxing district boundaries. Um, the board pays $5,000 a year to belong to FAIRCOM. As I've always said, it's a $5,000 insurance policy to protect 16 million a year, pretty good investment. Earlier this year, because we knew what was going on, uh, FAIRCOM issued a special assessment of 20,000, or sorry, $15,000. That $15,000 was shared proportionally with our area taxing districts that are impacted by the plant. Um, as things have picked up, we've had to use legal services to review language and to review proposals. 
We've leaned on our lobbyists in Springfield tremendously. And with everything, the flurry of activity that happened last weekend, um, the FAIRCOM Executive Committee met and in order to get us through the next month until the start of the fiscal year on July 1, we needed another $5,000 special assessment from each nuclear plant district. So that's what this is about. So in the end, the board will have invested $25,000 in this process, once again, to protect 16 million a year for the next five years. So once again, I think it's a pretty good investment. Um, before I ask, before the board takes action, I do wanna let you know where we're at. Um, there was a lot of work that went in the last four days. Those were some long, long nights. Uh, the General Assembly didn't get the massive electric bill passed on Monday evening or into Tuesday. Um, I, was, I was in contact with our lobbyists and legislators that went until 4 a.m. on Memorial Day or I guess the morning after before the Senate finally adjourned. Um, there is a, a reported agreement between the governor's office, organized labor and Exelon to uh, keep the plants open. Um, the plants that are in jeopardy are Byron and Dresden, which were announced to close. And at a late date, they included the Braidwood station as being at risk. Um, there's, there's multiple causes for the delay in not getting it passed on, uh, I guess it would be Tuesday morning. One of the things was that we really didn't get that agreement finalized until about 10 o'clock at night. So there wasn't time to get the language developed and reviewed for a midnight approval. So that's one issue. A second issue that has come up is a concern that some legislators, a few legislators have raised with the Prairie State Energy Campus, which is a 1600 megawatt base load coal fired electrical power station near uh, St. Louis. Um, this project was touted as being quote, clean coal. It's allegedly uh, one of the biggest generation polluters in the country. And because of that, there's a big argument going on with legislators right now on whether that plant as part of this legislation should close or whether it can stay open. Um, so that's holding up this as well. So as a result of the delay, we don't have access to the legislative language that's been agreed to, but uh, a Crane's article that was re recently posted said that Exelon and the governor agreed to 600 million in subsidies over a five-year period. So, you know, about $120 million a year, that would be for the Dresden, Byron and Braidwood stations, which Exelon has said that will keep those stations open at least for the next five years. Um, if the federal government comes through with financial support for nuclear power, which the Biden administration seems to be pushing right now, the state subsidy might be reduced or eliminated. So the best information I can give you right now is there is a verbal agreement but we don't have language. And our lobbyist is telling us that it could be June 15th before the House and Senate come back to pass this legislation. Um, because we have gone past midnight of the session, it now takes a three-fifths majority vote to pass it instead of a simple majority, which complicates the issue even further. So I'm encouraged, but I also don't want to give the message that this is all a done deal and we're good, because that's not the case either. So, Chuck? I'm just curious, uh, you said it's a five-year projected plan or, or deal. Is there anything other than that goes beyond five years? No. So this is a five-year agreement. And at the end of those five years, there's no guarantees of anything. It would have to be reassessed at that point. But there's a lot of things, Chuck, that could change in that five-year period of time. The It's a long, convoluted issue. but what has caused the financial strain on nuclear power is it's really twofold. Number one, it is the subsidies that the state provides to solar and wind that they don't provide to nuclear. And nuclear's argument is, hey, we're carbon free as well. We should get those subsidies also. Right. So that disadvantages them in the marketplace. Gotcha. The second issue is in the previous presidential administration, there was a FERC ruling that really favored fossil fuels, um, coal, natural gas. So in the PJM auction, those are advantaged over nuclear, wind, and solar. So those two things work against each other. 
and nuclear gets caught in the middle of that and they end up not being able to pass the auction and get the sub the capacity payments that they need uh, to stay open. So a lot could change during that period of time, which is why I think they didn't want to go. I don't think the governor wanted to go past five years. Um, and you know, Exelon created some of its own problems sure. with some of their legal issues as for well, sure, which sure. convoluted the problem also. Absolutely. So. But they, they just want to blow the playing field, right? Basically, that's what they're talking about. Essentially, that's what they, they want to be treated like solar and wind are treated. And they believe if they get treated like solar and wind, they can compete. And that's what they're asking for. So, you know, remember, there's, there's a difference, depending on who you talk to in the legislature, there's a difference between carbon-free energy and renewable energy. So wind and solar are considered renewable, nuclear is carbon-free. So it depends on what language they're using to provide incentives to get to the, the governor's goals of being carbon free by 2035. Right. So it's a good question though, Jim. Any any other questions or concerns? Just to go back to this, this is I agree with Dr. Buck, this five thousand dollars is the best money to spend. Because Faircom has done an awful lot to keep things where they should be. And, and just one final thing, I, I, I want to thank once again publicly uh, all the staff, community members, board members, anybody who made phone calls. Um, I made more phone calls the last three days than I think I've made in an entire five years. And uh, people that made those phone calls to the governor's office and the legislators, it makes a difference. Um, it, it matters. And so I appreciate the people that did that. I was making them at seven o'clock in the morning, getting a lot of answering machines, which is what I wanted to do. I didn't want to talk to anybody. So yeah, thank you everybody for, for what you did. And with I'm, I'm sorry, one no, other thing okay. that I'd be remiss if I didn't say, um, Senator Rosen, Senator Joyce, Representative Haas, Representative Walter, uh, they were our champions through this whole thing. Um, they fought for us, they, they worked hard, um, you know, uh, some of them are in the minority party, which makes it more <laughs> difficult for them, but they advocated for us and they advocated hard. And so I want to publicly thank them. We're not over the hump yet, but we are where we are significantly because of their advocacy work. Thank you as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for all thank you well. you. <laughs> My gosh, listen to things at midnight and all that yeah. stuff. My Lord. Thank you. It was interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure it, uh, it was. It reinforced my belief that when I retire, politics is not <laughs> in my future. <laughs> so. All right. Roll call, please, Lawanda. Chuck Landis. Yes. Robert Villagoda. Yes. Mary Gale. Yes. John Hamilton. Yes. McCarmon. Yes. Steve Rogers. Yes. Ken Miller. Yes. Before we go to new business, Jack, if you want to come in, sit down. Come on. It's okay. You're not going to interrupt us or bother us. You know, do you care, Mr. Miller, if we jump to Jack? Absolutely ID? not. Because uh, Jack has dance recitals not. going on, and I know he's dying to get back to that. So. Yeah, I am. You go right ahead, Jack. So uh, Jack is here to talk to the board about, um, and there's no action tonight, but it's to talk to the board about the possibility of the drama club resuming their trip uh, that they have taken. So, Jack, I'll turn it over to you and let you kind of talk to the board about what your thoughts are and what you're looking to do. Sure. So we had just we had it approved for obviously this past year to go in the spring of 2021 and that did not happen. Um, and so basically we're just looking to kind of continue that trip just in the following school year. Uh, the only thing that's really changed since the first time we went back in 2019 uh, with about 45 kids and parents um, had a great experience. The only thing that I'm talking with Mr. Spencer through a couple of things is I'm looking at a bunch of the tour companies, a lot of the concerns from the board in terms of security and all of those things were things that were being provided by the hotel entities and all those different things, not necessarily the tour company. Um, so we did receive a quote from the tour company we used last time um, to fly instead of drive because that was a quite interesting trip through the uh, turnpike. Um, but it was around $1,500 for a four night stay um, whereas if we go kind of through all the stuff ourselves and talking with Brad Brazy, similar to what he's done with the Kohler and character trip, um, we can get that trip cost down to about 1200 for an additional day and seeing an additional show. 
Um, and then last year, or if we fundraised the same amount that we had fundraised for the previous trip, um, which was about $15,000, that'll bring the trip costs down to the kids um, to about $850 for a five day trip in New York, seeing five Broadway shows and then touring several of the theaters and meeting with some of the people and some of the actors that we've done virtual master classes with throughout the year um, have, have kind of reached out now that things are reopening and hoping to meet us in person when we get back out there. So it's just kind of a general thing for us. I just, if it is something that things start to reopen and we are able to take trips, I just don't want the students to be in a crunch time of trying to fundraise and come up with that money in a three month turnaround. So that's why I was just trying to get ahead of it and go through that. But I can answer any additional questions too. Okay. Anybody have any questions from Jack? No. Jack, is there anything you just need to let us know that's coming up, right? No, we yeah, when I, right now there's policy in place sure. that we can't take trips, but right. Right. I know so, they're working on the DC stuff. And so just to kind of. I think, Jack, when uh, when that opens back up again, be ready with a proposal. Yeah. Okay. You can get to Mr. Spencer and okay. uh, he can get to the board because the board has to approve all of our trips. And then the only other thing I would tell you is if you wanted to start any fundraising, just have a mechanism that if we end up at a point we can't go, what's your plan? Well, and to be honest with you, that was the only reason we were really able to do all of the performance opportunities we did this year, because we had been fundraising for New York and had kind of this money that was gonna be used for that trip. Um, and that money went to renting outdoor equipment and all of that stuff to do all the shows this year. So that was really the only reason we were able to, that and obviously the support of the board, but a lot of those additional expenses came from those fundraising efforts that were already completed. And what so, we're still hearing is that June 11th is supposed to be right. phase five. And New York is in full open so, and Broadway, I think yeah. is September 14th. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how quickly the state board and IDPH right. follow up, but right. we should know I would say, <coughs> before the end of June. Okay? Yep. All right. Anybody have any questions? Anybody? Thank you, Jerry. Okay, thank you, Jack. Yep. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. You bet. Okay. All right, moving on to new business, and uh, I will entertain a first and second motion to approve the renewal of the Press Plus annual subscription at a cost of $4,150. Bob so moves and Quint seconds. Anyone want to mention nope. about that? Roll call, please, Lawanda. Robert Bianco. Yes. Quint Harmon. Yes. Mary Gill. Yes. John Hamilton. Yes. Jeff Lander. Yes. Steve Rogers. Yes. And Bill. Yes. Entertain a first and second motion to approve the 2021-2022 membership renewal of the Illinois Association of School Boards at a cost of $7,625. Quint so moves and Chuck seconds. Uh, roll call, please, Lawanda. Quint Carmen. Yes. Chuck Landon. Yes. Robert Bianca. Yes. Mary Gill. Yes. John Hamilton. Yes. Steve Rogers. Yes. Yes. First and second motion to approve the school emergency operations response plan as presented. John so moves and Mary seconds. And he... Yeah, a couple things. So one, you see you don't have that in front of you. Uh, Mrs. Rakes has a binder that is somewhere. <laughs> we'll get it for you. Uh, the reason that we can't make that public is that it's our crisis plan. And there are things in there about where our students go if, you know, hopefully it never happens, but right. you got to be prepared if there were ever an armed intruder situation. And we can't make that public because you don't want people uh, knowing where you're going. And so the board can review that document. Um, it is our crisis plan. Uh, Luke and Sandy spent a lot of time updating that for us. And then once the board approves that, we will meet with our first responders and share that with them and ask for their feedback as well. So uh, that's an annual process that we go through. But we have the binder coming. So if, uh, if any board members would like to look at that, you can look at it after the meeting, or you can uh, come in here at any point and we'll, we'll let you take a look. Any questions? But thanks to Sandy and Luke and their team for giving that. For Thank you. Time. Thank you, Sandy and Luke. Okay, roll call, please, Wanda. John Hamilton. Yes. Mary Gill. Yes. Robert Bianca. Yes. Mike Harmon. Yes. Chuck <coughs> Yes. Steve Rogers. Yes. Ken Miller. Yes. Uh, next item on the agenda is a discussion item on the proposed redevelopment of the skating rink property by the intermediate school. Um, as the board, uh, whenever we get, because we're a neighbor, whenever something is, is going in front of planning and zoning, we get a letter and get notice of that. 
and I always bring those to the board at a board meeting to let you know, and I always try to attend those planning and zoning meetings. Um, that planning and zoning meeting is going to take place on June 21st. Uh, as you see in there, the proposal is to redevelop the skating rink into an apartment complex. Uh, at the beginning, they had talked about 16 units. Um, I heard 12 units. I, I, I don't know for sure where that's going to be. I don't know. I, I assume I'll get that information before the 21st. Uh, Matt Fritz contacted me. Um, today, which I appreciated and said that he would share information at a later date with me. Um, I mean, obviously, as you know, the Board of Education doesn't have the authority to determine land use in the village, uh, but I did want to attend the public hearing and make sure that I was able to express any concerns that the Board of Education might have. Um, as you know, we're in the middle of a residential area there at the intermediate school. Um, the, you know, the main concern that I can tell you that I've already shared with Matt Fritz is the busing issue. Um, you know, we don't have parent pickup and drop off back there, but we use that for uh, busing. And so, you know, if there were any traffic issues and buses couldn't get in and out of there, that would be an issue for us. And I've already expressed that concern. Um, but I do want to open that up to the board. Any comments, anything that you would like me to ask? Um, at the planning and zoning meeting. Anybody have anything? <clears throat> if we're going to walk in, I'd like to do it. Sure. We'll see. Sure. We'll see what happens. I hear you said, Ken, what? Pardon me? I didn't hear you said. No, I just said if we don't have a ballgame down that, I may go to the meeting. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, the, from our perspective, the, the municipalities, villages, they're the ones that are responsible. They're the ones that are in charge of zoning property, planning property, comprehensive plans, all that stuff. So, um, you know, that final decision is on them, what they decide to do with that based upon whatever's presented at the planning and zoning yeah. hearing. People have to give testimony. It's all under oath, all that stuff. So that, that all happens in, in their reign. So we can make our wishes known, but yeah, yeah but at the end of the day, for a decision, at the end of the day, we, we educate the kids to come to us no matter where they come from. So Bob, I was going to just ask uh, for a better understanding of the roadway around there. How is it going? What, how much of, I mean, part of that was our property, I believe, and part of it was rubber skating ring part. Yeah. What has been done to it? Is it now set up as a village line? What are they going to maintain? How would, how is it all this going to work? Because that's the one most important thing is to keep that open for us. Yeah, yeah, and I think we need to know that. Yeah, yeah. right, Bob. Right now, currently, we own part of that yeah. street between the, the skating rink and the baseball field. And the skating rink owns part of it. Right, but the question is whether or not the village has taken over right. Right. control of it. Because I, where I live, the county owns half of my or owns half the road in front of my house. <laughs> oh, actually, I own half the road in front of my house. But that there's an easement right away there that I have no control of. Right, right. And I want to make sure that there is something there that would maintain that open road requirements there. Okay. 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 Um, Mr. Miller, if you don't mind, I know we have some people here that sure. are interested in this, and instead of waiting for the public comment time, if they have any comments that they would like to make, Absolutely. I want to open the, Absolutely. the floor. If you don't, that's fine, but if anybody... I'll, I'll talk. We won't make you, but if you want to make <laughs> something, go ahead. Um, I am Danielle Diamond, most of you. Mm -hmm. I live right across the street from the Rollery, at 175 East Carbon Street. Our main concern is traffic flow as it is when we, we do have ball games when there are buses um they've had it less than a week they've already moved things out and i've already noticed that they're out there late in the day blocking part of washington street which is actually a road it looks like an alley where's the washington, washington street <laughs> they actually live right there on washington street i think right now there's a flow of traffic because the problem is if you ever been down there it's washington street that's very narrow Carbon actually ends at the end of the backstop of home plate. <laughs> then it kind of jets over a little bit and then it goes east further, where it's just where the school has their property. And then it kind of jots along and that little row where one house is, that's for Million Street. The carbon ends right there. But yeah, at the back, the home plate. Yeah. Right. I'm concerned with if they're going to have the parking lot where it is now. When the buses do come in, how are they going to be exiting out of the parking lot during pickups and during drop-offs? Okay. 
Yeah. So you're you have the traffic flow issue the same as the board does. Yes. Yeah. So and it's it's our house. So it's already a hard enough time for us in the morning. Um, I'm just concerned with what they do because it's 12, so they'll need at least 32 parking spots. Right. Okay. I know they asked for 36 parking spots to get to 16, but they can't because they wanted it on the road. They wanted four spots, and I guess that was kind of. Taken back. That's why we're doing it now. Twelve. Okay. And the requirements, I believe, is the thirty-two in order to have twelve units of property. Sure. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate that. Ladies, anybody else? No. no. And you know, I think we share the same concerns. Yeah. So you know, we need to make sure that that's that's part of and yeah. that needs to be explained as to what that's going to happen. Um, okay. Yes. Remember. Yes, ma'am. I when, when there are park there on um, such an afternoon. When school's laying out, I've seen people go down that road and pass the school buses, and that's on normal traffic days. So I think they can do it until the stop sign. Yeah, but what, what I'm saying is like it's pretty much single file traffic, single as, file it traffic as it is, mm -hmm. and you're they've gotten mad at school buses for being there. Like that's school property; you can get mad at them. <laughs> Um, and I've had to go out and explain that to people who have gotten mad. Yeah, and they'll, they'll stop right there picking up kids that walk across the campus because they don't want to go through the car lane. Sure. And they'll block the, the end, which is actually Washington mm -hmm. Street. And like, you, you can stick a park alley, there. but you can't park there. That's yeah. a road. Okay. Yeah. So right. we'll express so. the traffic issues, which seems to be the board's issues. Absolutely. Well. So thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank thank you. Ladies. Thank thank you. you. Yeah. We appreciate that. Okay, let's move on then. I will entertain a first and second motion to establish July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022 as a fiscal year and approve the 2021-2022 Board of Education meeting dates and board study sessions for the whole meeting dates as presented. Chuck so moves, do I have a second? Clint seconds. Anything you want to mention about that? Okay, roll call, please, Lawanda. Chuck Landon. Yes. Brett Harmon. Yes. Robert Blankett. Yes. Mary Hill. Yes. Sean Hamilton. Yes. Steve Rogers. Yes. Kendall. Yes. And I need a first and second motion to approve the district consolidation plan as presented. Quint so moves. Mary seconds. Anything you want to mention? Um, no, these are our state grants. Appreciate right. uh, Jason, Luke, Tammy, Jen, Kenny, Sandy, everybody that yep. took time in to get this done. Everybody that did it, yeah. Okay, roll call, please, Alana. Quint Harmon. Yes. Mary Gill. Yes. Robert Bianchetta. Yes. Sean Hamilton. Yes. Chuck Lander. Yes. Steve Rogers. Yes. And Bill. Yes. Entertain a first and second motion to approve the consent agenda with the resolutions as presented and to waive the reading of the resolutions. Chuck so moves on seconds. This is every year. <laughs> right. These every year. Yep. Roll call, please, Lawanda. Jeff Landon. Yes. Sean Hamilton. Yes. Robert B. Yes. Mary Gale. Yes. Clint Harmon. Yes. Steve Rogers. Yes. Ken Miller. Yes. Okay. Jay, anything you want to say about insurance renewal? Just to remind the board that we're part of uh, insurance cooperatives on both the health side and the GL worker comp side. And so uh, we are in that cooperative until the board decides to be out of that cooperative. So there's no action that is required. Just wanted to update the board on what the worker comp premium and the GL premiums are, were going to look like. Um, so entertain any questions the board would have. Anything you want to mention? I got one question. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, uh, go ahead. I just wanted to get an idea of how does the increases compare to uh, general increases for insurance and that? So in the, in the aggregate, we're only seeing a 1% increase industry trend is anywhere from seven to 11 percent okay. um, these two insurances are unique because they're based on they're based on claims worker comp in particular uh, if you'll notice our worker comp coverage decreased by about five thousand dollars the general liability increased by nearly seven thousand dollars and that's almost all related to cyber liability uh, which is a big issue right now um, and so i think we're the cooperative I, in my opinion has again um, helped us to mitigate those costs because we're sharing claims across so many other um, entities and so much other property that's covered. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Jay? Okay, then let's move on. I entertain a first second motion to approve the renewal agreement with Navians for 36 months at a total cost of $10,500 as presented. When so moves, do I have a second? Five seconds.
Yeah, I'm going to have Mr. Spencer just quickly explain so the board's aware of what we use uh, Naviance for the high school. So this is, I think, our third year using Naviance. Uh, it's a program that, and you've heard Dr. Bug and Tammy talk a lot about college and career readiness. This helps us uh, gain the indicators that we need to, to have for that. Um, it collects valuable mm -hmm. information from students. It has, it has a wide variety of opportunities for them to get into career research. Uh, there's personal inventories, um, interest inventories that they can do. Um, that can lead to them finding maybe a career that they're interested in. Um, and then from there, they can do research on that career, what kind of education or training do they need, um, maybe what the salary is, that type of thing. Um, we also are, uh, we started college and career readiness or exploration class this year. Next year, we're making that uh, mandatory for a freshman to take. Um, this class will be, or this Naviance is something we're going to use in that class. They'll go through, every student will have a login. Actually, we just recently purchased by Power School. Um, so they'll, they'll probably use a, a summer of log, login. So um, it, it's something that they're going to, the students are going to use from day one and because they enter high school and have this college and career exploration class. Um, but there's, there's every year, I, as I talk to the counselors, they're learning more and more of what we can do with Naviance. Um, but it's, it's a great way for them to get in, the students to get in and do some research and get ready. Uh, there, there's a resume built on it. They'll have a resume built during this, this class as well that Naviance will help them with. So, as you see, there's a lot of different things that it has. Uh, it's been very valuable for us to, for us to use with our students. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay, roll call, please, number one. Yes. 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 Entertain a first and second motion to approve the renewal agreement with asset control solutions to provide biennial fixed set inventory services as presented. I'm <laughs> uh, John so moves. Yeah. Chuck seconds. Jay, anything you want to say about that? So the board typically does a physical inventory every other year, and this is just standard physical. Okay. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Roll call, please, Luanda. John Hamilton. Yes. But Chuck Landis. Yes. Robert That's a tough motion. Mary Campbell. Yes. 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 Steve Rogers. Yes. Ken Miller. Yes. Let it first and second motion to approve the filing of the quarterly dropout report to the regional office of education for the quarter ending June 1st, 2021. Chuck so moves and Bob seconds. Roll call the woman. Yes. Robert Gantel. Yes. Yes. Sean Hamilton. Yes. Yes. Steve Rogers. Yes. Ken Miller. Yes. Letter data first and second motion to approve the 36th month lease agreement with American Capital Financial Services at the annual cost of $68,758.96 as presented. Bob so moves. Do I have a second? Mary second. Anything you want to mention about that? Okay. Just the Chromebook refresh um, for this year. So just a, again, standard business. Any questions? Nope. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Entertain a first and second motion to accept the lowest responsible bid for waste disposal recycling from environmental recycling and disposal pending completion of all appropriate documents and to reject all other bids. Oh. Chuck so moves. Mary seconds. Yeah, just uh, real quick, and I want to give. Uh, Jason, all the credit because uh, when, as you know, the village recently moved to uh, using environmental, and Jason thought, hey, maybe we could go out to bid and get a better deal, and we got a better deal. So, uh, about Jay saved five, six thousand dollars somewhere yeah. there, yeah, um, by just going out for bid and doing that. So, uh, well done. Thank you, thank you, Jason. Thank you. Roll call. Chuck Landy. Yes. Mary Gill. Yes. Robert Bainton. Yes. Sean Hamilton. Yes. Mike Harley. Yes. Steve Rogers. Yes. And yes. There's been a first and second motion to approve the agreement with Bill Guardian at a cost of $25,883.54 as presented. Bob so moves. Chuck seconds. Jay. So the Children's Internet Protection Act requires us to filter content on the internet. Um, we use GoGuardian currently to manage our Chromebooks while the students are remote, um, as well as on uh, premise. Um, in the past, in the, over the last three years, we've used Securely as our web content filter. Um, that contract was up, um, and we felt that it made sense to um, add on the GoGuardian's portion of the filter so that we could have one uh, one pane of glass, if you would, to be able to monitor students. 
um, as they work, as well as the content that they're seeing on their Chromebooks. So um, that's the that's this additional invoice that's for adding on that module. Entertain any questions? Anybody have any questions? Roll call, please, Luana. Yes. 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 I will entertain a first and second motion to approve the resolution recognizing Sandy Rakes, and I would like to read that for you. Whereas Sandy Rakes has served Coal City Community Unit School District number one as its director of special populations for the past 12 years. Whereas Sandy Rakes was instrumental in realizing the Board of Education's role to provide special education services under the control and direction of the Coal City Community Unit number one school district. Whereas Sandy Rake served as an advocate for special education students to be educated in programs within the Coal City Community Unit School Number One District as opposed to out of district programs. Whereas Sandy Rake served as a passionate advocate for all students with special education needs. Whereas Sandy Rake served as the principal of the Coal City Early Childhood Center to assist the school district in reducing costs. Whereas Sandy Rake served as a director of transportation for the Coal City Community School District Number One. Whereas Sandy Rakes facilitated the development of a crisis plan for Coal City Community Unit Number One. Whereas Sandy Rakes was instrumental in the development of the return to school plan that allowed students to experience in person learning throughout the 2021 school year during the pandemic. Whereas Sandy Rakes has been a loyal and dedicated employee of Coal City Community Unit Number One for the past 12 years. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Coal City Community Unit School District Board of Education to recognize Sandy Riggs for her exemplary service and dedication to students, staff, and community of this school district. Very much. And then we've got it. Yep. Shaw, Quince, Moons, and Bob seconds. Roll call, please, go on. Absolutely. Robert Jenkins. Yes. Mary Jo. Yes. 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 Amen. Um, I just wanted to mention one more thing, and I'm not trying to make this more difficult for Sandy, but uh, uh, you know, I, I met Sandy 25 years ago when I was applying for an assistant principal position at Wilmington High School, and Sandy was part of that interview team. Remember that? And. Uh, Little did I know at that point what an important role she was going to play in my professional life. Uh, Sandy taught me a lot of important lessons that have not only made me a better administrator, but a better person. Um, as a very young administrator, she taught me that when disciplining students, you can advocate for your staff and advocate for the student at the same time. It's not an either or proposition. She taught me that special needs students need their regular education peers, and when that environment is created, all kids better. She taught me that no matter the severity of the disability, all of our students deserve the opportunity to be educated in our schools and be a part of our community. She taught me that all students need an adult advocate, which is why Sandy went to prom and other events to make sure her special needs students were able to participate just like their regular ed peers. She taught me to keep things in perspective. A student getting in a fight doesn't mean we overreact and condemn that student for the rest of their educational career. Instead, we find out why that student got in a fight and we develop a plan to address those issues so it doesn't happen again. That's real education and that's real leadership. She taught me that organizational climate and staff morale matter. You can't just keep asking people to do more without once in a while bringing them a Morris Bakery dot donut. And most importantly, she taught me that friendship always trumps business. And you can never become so focused on business that you forget to be there when your friends need you. And she's always been there when I need her. Sandy, I hope you're proud of what you built here at this school district. We're going to miss your expertise. We're going to miss your advocacy and your passion for our special needs students. Thank you for being part of my team and agreeing to come here to Coal City School District 12 years ago. Happy retirement, and I'm going to miss you. I hope that everyone will please stay after. We Absolutely. have uh, Kate and are going to have a quick reception to honor Sandy. Sandy, is there anything you would like to say? <laughs> I understand that. That's okay. On behalf of the board, we can't thank you enough for your service here to the district. You, you've just done a wonderful job, and you know, words can't express always our appreciation for all the job you've done. So. You've moved us through a lot of ways and a lot of same things, and we certainly do appreciate that. So 
All I can say is don't be a stranger, okay? All right. And like I said, one of these days you'll be able to drive by this building and that's, yeah, you know, that'll happen. I can drive by the high school now and just... Just for that no. Yep, you say, oh, well. <laughs> you know, I, I appreciate the time we put in there, but it's, you know, it's okay now. So enjoy your retirement, please. Yeah. All right. And just think tomorrow morning, wow, she doesn't have to come in there. Well, she does. Yeah, yes. she does. She's okay. still working. <laughs> All right. She's still working. Yeah. Still working. Right. She's still working. We'll reach that day, though. We'll get that down. Say, hey, <laughs> you know, that, that situation, you know, the hard work. But then you think, no, I don't have to anymore. So, again, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Okay. Any items not known at agenda time or any communication, any communication with the floor in regard to items or anything in general? Mr. Harmon. You know, this morning I attended the, the breakfast and you know what really to me it was an honor to be there. Uh, the people retired, uh, what the staff has accomplished. Uh, Mr. Miller had a very nice story this morning about Winston Churchill. And that got me thinking um, many moons ago when I took the longest camping trip of my life. Um, going through ranger school, there were three, three words that they drilled into us day after day after day. And it dawned on me that this district took those three and took it to a whole new level. And very proud of that. Um, when you're in that situation, you're, you're taught to identify, assess, and then overcome. And this district has done that. Um, not only for COVID, but for every issue that's ever come about, um, even with the um, You reacted, everybody reacted properly. Um, every Since I've been on this board, every obstacle we've ever had, um, the staff is exemplary when it comes to um, overcoming and taking us to the, to the next level. I mean, we're all individual votes. And we're told we're given options and we vote on those options. And uh, again, leadership is huge. Um, you know, Luke, we know you're you're gonna take us to the next level, and uh, those are big shoes to fill um, when we lose uh, experienced staff. But um, I never could I, I I can't be any prouder in serving for this district. Um, Thanks, Glenn. Well, yes, job well done. Absolutely. Well done. Appreciate, Appreciate that. If you want to listen to Churchill story, I can go to you sometime. It is a good story. <laughs> it is good. It is good. Okay. Anything else? No. Anybody else want to mention anything? All right. I would then call your attention to the next board study session, is June 30th. And the next regular meeting is July 7th. And with that said, 708. I will entertain first and second motion to adjourn. And Quinn already had his hand up and Chuck seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Hold the same sign. And we are adjourned. Stick